And open up to 1 Samuel chapter 31 as we finish out the book of 1 Samuel. It's been 38 previous studies. Uh, Today is our 39th study. With 31 chapters is not very bad. Uh, Our goal is to take a chapter a week here in our midweek service, and we've been, we did pretty well in pausing in those places where we needed to pause. And already, you know, when you study through a book of the Bible, if you haven't been through too many with us, you also have to remember that the first few studies are all preparatory, uh, introductory. So we'll usually spend two or three Bible studies alone gaining the concept of the history of the book, uh, where we are in the time and the history of the nation of Israel, and some background information. So 39 studies isn't bad. As we come to the last chapter of 1 Samuel, you remember that the book opened with the birth of a gifted baby, his name Samuel. But unfortunately, chapter 31, the book closes with the death of a guilty man, King Saul. And it's a discouraging end to a life. It's a discouraging end to a man who had so much potential who had so many of the qualities that makes for a good servant of God, a good leader of God, but his life didn't end well. He is not able to say, like Paul was, that he had run his race, that he had completed the work. He didn't. It was very early on in his reign, in his rulership, that he was rejected by God. Just two years, just two years he's rejected. And because of his disobedience and rejection of God, because he found himself unwilling to let God reign over him, God rejected him from ruling over his people. It was Saul's pride, and it was Saul's impatience. It was Saul's disobedience. It was his life of deception. They were all seen and judged by the Lord himself. And Samuel announced the sentence to him. The crown would eventually be taken from him and given to another. In this case, we know it was David. And this made King Saul even all the more, you know, out of his mind. There were times in his life where you just, we we weren't able to, to pen it. What is it, Saul? How can someone so close to God end up so far from him? And we learned, didn't we, through the backdrop of the darkness of Saul's life that God is seeking for a man after his own heart. And he found him in David. And it was in chapter 13, verse 13, I believe, that the phrase was used of King Saul, the Lord would have. Remember, we spent a whole Bible study on that topic. The Lord would have. And we asked ourselves, is that what we want to hear in our lives? With the compromise in your life, is that really, is it really worth it? With the things that you're dabbling in, with the excuses that we're, I mean, I know I may only be speaking to just a few, but for the few, it's that important is that what you, pronounce, you want pronounced over your life? The Lord would have? Of all the things that God could have done in your life, all the things that he wanted to do in your life? And see, while you're listening to me right now, it's not too late to turn things around. It's not too late to make things right, to not hear the Lord would have, but rather to hear the words that we would expect, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. What a great motivating thing. But those four words the Lord would have mark, I mean, I looked for the thing that would just mark King Saul's life, and that that to me just marked his life. That, that, That summed up his life in total. The Lord would have. And now, as we pick up in verse 1 of chapter 31, it says that the Philistines fought against Israel. And the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. Then the Philistines followed hard after Saul and his sons, and the Philistines killed Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malchushua, Saul's sons. Now the battle became intense against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was severely wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor-bearer, Draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised men come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor-bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. Therefore, Saul took a sword and fell on it. And when his armor-bearer saw that Saul, saw that Saul was dead, he also fell on his sword and died with him. So Saul, his three sons, his armor-bearer, and all his men died together that same day. This, we recall, is the battle 
that the Philistines were, well, the battle that David almost joined the Philistines, and God delivered him. And here there are too much for the armies of Israel, and Israel loses this battle. Many were slain. The battle that David was encouraged to join, but God so graciously rescued him from such a horrible decision. And then Saul, well, notice part of the loss here was the sons of Saul, those that were close to him, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malchishua. And then they went after Saul. Saul was next. This is the prophecy. Hold your places. Turn over to 1 Chronicles with me. That's to the right, 1 Chronicles chapter 10. We gain a little bit more insight on the battle here. 1 Chronicles chapter 10. Notice with me verse 13. It explains as we look around the entirety of this with his sons dying as also King Saul dying. It says in verse 13 of 1 Chronicles chapter 10 that Saul died for his unfaithfulness which he had committed against the Lord because he did not keep the word of the Lord and also because he consulted a medium for guidance. But he did not inquire the Lord, therefore he killed him and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. And we see how it happened now that God allowed victory to come to the Philistines over King Saul. And he's being judged for his unfaithfulness, his disobedience. And, and whether you're a believer or an unbeliever tonight, understand this. There is, a, there is an overarching principle when it comes to our relationship with God or to how God deals with his creation. It's simply this. What a man sows, that's what he'll reap. What a man sows, that's what he'll reap. Paul wrote to the, wrote, taught us that in the book of Galatians. And you think, well, you know, I'm, I'm a forgiven person. I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I've been born again. And yes, what a man sows, that he'll also reap. The decisions of your life will affect you. You, you a farmer, if, you, if we had the opportunity to interview a farmer today and just ask him about the typical basic things of farming, and there's not many farmers among us. There are a few, but not many. And we began to talk to them about, well, you know, how, how do you get apple trees? How, how do you get all those apple trees on your farm? Well, son, I plant apple seeds. Really? Yeah, because I know if I plant apple seeds, I'll see the trees go up. Or orange trees, or, or whatever it is that they want. What you sow is what you, you know, if I was to ask him, well, wait a minute, you don't plant... Uh, apple seeds and expect orange trees and then uh, you can think you're foolish boy you don't know what you're talking about you've never been on the farm and I'd say to that you're right I am a novice I am a boy I'm a young man when it comes to the things of farming I don't know however even though I'm not a farmer I wouldn't ask such a question because I know what I sow and what I put into the ground is what's going to come back up so believer you can't just say those of you that are born again, you go, well, you know, I'm under the blood of Jesus Christ and he forgives me of all of our sins, all of my sins. It's a true statement and one to be gloriously held on to. But that doesn't relieve you of the spiritual principle that what you sow is what you're going to reap. It's not going to be any other way. And for, for those of you that are here or listening in from afar that, you know, you, you have no relationship with God, that principle works for you as well. What you sow is what you reap. The consequences of your life right now, most likely, are because of what you've done. Now, occasionally there are things that happen to us that happen outside of us. And we just sit back and say, okay, Lord, we just wait for you to sort it all out. But a lot of the consequences we face are from our own decisions. And here Saul is reaping the consequences. Not only that, but the fulfillment of prophecy and it's interesting, as you'll notice back in 1 Samuel, that he says, he tells his armor bearer in verse 4, you know, draw your sword and kill me because I don't want to be abused. And the Philistines were known for abusing, mutilating, and torturing their victims. Saul begged his armor bearer to kill him, to avoid abuse. And when the young man failed to comply, we see Saul falling on his sword. Saul did what was wrong in committing suicide, or at least in the attempt, because those of you that are read ahead to chapter 1 of 2 Samuel, there is a different viewpoint of the same situation. And we'll get to that a little bit tonight and also next time. But one of the things I want you to notice here with Saul 
even though there's a little bit of controversy over chapter 31 of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel chapter 1, there, there isn't, there's some things that, aren't, that are lost. Some people like to argue about things, and when you're always arguing about things, you tend to miss the point. And so I don't want us to miss the point in the midst of the controversy here. And there's a few things I want to draw out. The first one is I want you to notice that Saul takes matters into his own hands again. Faced with possible abuse. We don't know what would happen, although the kings usually got the worst treatment. But faced again with something he didn't want to deal with, he took things into his own hands and fell on his sword, hoping to protect himself. And then his armor bearer, thinking that he was dead, ended up killing himself, which led to another death in Saul's death. Now the controversy with this section of scripture surrounds whether King Saul actually died or was killed, or, or was mortally, or was fatally wounded, or uh, maybe fatally wounded would lead to death, but a wound that didn't lead to death. And then later on in chapter 1, we have a, uh, an account of a Malachite coming uh, and finishing him off. So one view is that King Saul here, uh, he fell on his sword and did die, thus committing suicide. Another view is that King Saul fell on a sword. That's not de of debate, but he didn't die all the way, and the Amalekite came and finished him off. Now, in the first view, the Amalekite is just seen as a liar trying to save his life. In the second view, it is both those chapters put together. And I'll clear it up for you uh, next time when we get into chapter 1. But let's speak to the topic of, let's look at the first view and say that Saul committed suicide here. And let's speak to the topic of suicide for a moment because the question comes up all the time. Is suicide okay? And the answer to that is no. The answer is no. Suicide is not from the Lord. As hard as things are and as difficult as your life might be today and as hopelessness has settled into your heart and as your mind is confused and your flesh is weak, and the enemy of your souls is throwing accusations at you, and maybe even I read recently of a very sad article where there's a young girl standing trial, young girl meaning a teenager. She's standing trial right now because she didn't prevent the suicide of her boyfriend, but rather encouraged it over and over again through text messages. And from the heart of the Lord, he doesn't encourage you to end your life. It's not okay. It's never the right decision to make. It's never the right decision to take your own life. What will happen is you'll end your life and make life for those that love you very, very difficult the rest of their lives. It solves nothing. From a biblical standpoint, the Bible forbids murder. It's one of the top ten. And suicide is self-murder. Thus, God condemns it. And I know that we live in a culture that is devaluing life. Once held at the highest standard, life is now being mis misused and reassigned. And now instead of looking at the ultimate value of life that God has placed... Instead, it's become discussions over the quality of life as if some level of quality of life then ushers in a whole new industry known as a physician-assisted suicides, euthanasia, or a variety of other options of ending a life early because the quality of those that are still alive and the, the attitude of those looking at the quality of life thinking, well, it's too low to really to really care. So when you think of suicide, even though it's legal in some states now, at the assistance of doctors, suicide is still murder. The Bible forbids it. And he alone has the right to take it. God gave life and he alone has the right to take it. This also includes abortion. It also includes euthanasia, physician-assisted suicide. It is all contrary to the Word of God and to the heart of God. Not just the wooden, strong standing of theology, although I believe theologically it is not God's desire. I also believe it's not His heart. 
And what Saul's doing right now in chapter 31 is a sin. And it's not something you want to be the last act of your life. Even the most desperate believers in the Bible who desired death never considered suicide a morally viable alternative. Instead, recognizing the sovereign hand of God over human life, they prayed like Jonah did. Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. But they kept it and left it in the hands of the Lord. They didn't take it upon themselves. He was so desperate. And you know Jonah's, uh, excuse me, you know uh, Jonah's story, just being stuck in disobedience in a hopeless situation. He cries out to the Lord. And even though they wanted and were in a desperate place of wanting God to take it, they never considered it God's heart for them to take it themselves. The Bible teaches, with the exception of Samson in Judges chapter 16, that there are at least five cases of suicide that are recorded of us, and none of them is proved by God. Whether it was Abimelech in Judges chapter 9, Saul here in 1 Samuel 31, Zimri in 1 Kings 16, Ahithophel in 2 Samuel, we'll get to him in verse chapter 17, and ultimately Judas in Matthew chapter 27. None of them were approved by God. They all met a tragic death, and not, yet none without divine approval. Suicide is an attack upon the image of God, as man has been made in the image of God, according to Genesis chapter 1, an attempt to usurp God's sovereignty over human life. It's not God's heart for you. Now, that's the Bible's teaching. That is as direct as it possibly can be, can be given to you on all of those topics, although today it's suicide. But let's bring it down to a more relatable, understandable conversation for the sake of someone listening to this. If you're battling suicidal thoughts right now, it doesn't make you a bad person. And it doesn't make you a bad believer. It makes you a person that's struggling with the reality of life. It makes you a person that perhaps is overwhelmed by the circumstances of life. It makes you a person looking for solutions to the difficulty in your life. And if you're having those suicidal thoughts, please ask for help. Let us into your life. Tell somebody what's going on. One of the greatest regrets of those that love those that have committed suicide is that thought that they wish they could have helped, but they didn't see anything. And those that commit suicide sometimes will sit there in their agony, and perhaps I'm speaking directly to you, and you are so upset, and you're so wrestling with things that you even begin to think that nobody cares because nobody's asking you. And yet at the same time, there's a lot of people that care. We just don't see it. God hasn't revealed it to us. You seem to be handling things, and, and when we ask you if you're okay, you say, yeah, we're okay, I'm okay. And we're asking that question not just for the sake of, of starting conversation. You know, you could be having people in your life, are you okay? And that's your invitation to say, no, I'm not okay. Even if you, you know, you share it with them, wait, you're not, I'm not okay, and I don't even think you can help me. Well, that's okay, well, let's talk about it. I might be able to help you, I might not be able to help you, but just you getting it out might help. But if you're having suicidal thoughts, ask. I know your life is filled with all sorts of fears, emotions, and feelings, and just plain thoughts of hopelessness, like nothing will change. Like it hasn't changed, it's not changing, and it'll never change. You may feel like you're the only one that understands, that no one else can understand. Nobody else gets it. And in some places maybe we don't fully understand we haven't lived your life we don't know the personal pain that you're going through but to help you we don't have to understand everything we just have to love you and i believe that god can use us to express love to you that you can ask for help my heart goes out to you personally the desperation that you're in i'm sorry that life has become so hard for you so difficult so hopeless but suicide's not the answer Taking your own life will not solve the problem. It's not the answer now and it's not the answer ever. Let's give the situation some time so God can work things out where things can change. God can show you how things are going to sort out. 
He can show you that things will get a little bit easier. Jesus has a way of restoring the lost joy. Jesus has a way of healing pain and helping us sort through difficulties in our lives. I don't believe it was by accident today as I was hosting the live radio show that a man by the name of Ace called in. Now, I didn't immediately remember Ace's first call. Uh, He had called the show before. And he had called the show, a radio show. He dialed the number on his phone to talk to someone live in the midst of his suicidal thoughts. He was ready. As one person described it, it sounded like he was ready to sign off. And he began to share some of the things that were going on in his life. He began to share to get them out. He had mentioned that he struggled with some PTSD and all the things going on in his mind. And and he had come to the conclusion that it was hopeless. And we said, no, no, no. Give us your number, Ace. Let's get in touch with you. There's a brother in the church that can serve you. And just give us a chance. Just give us a chance to talk things through. And so we got his number, and there was some ministry going out, and Randy connected with him. And if you listen today, you know, he called today, and he was a different man. He wasn't in the pit of hopelessness anymore. He he wasn't ready to end his life anymore. He was alive. He was making the changes in his life. He had... He had been able to get through that difficult time with just a little bit of help and a lot of prayer and the very power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And what is he talking about today? He's praying about his relatives. He's praying about a surgery that's upcoming for his sister. He's talking about getting his house in order. And if you listen, he was actually at the dealership. He said he was at the dealership, took a break for whatever he was doing to to try to trade in his truck or his car that had high payments and get one that would give him lower payments because he's so much in tune with what God wants to do in his life that he's getting his finances in order so he can be used greater from the Lord. I mean, it's an amazing thing that God can do. It's not, it's not a radio station, and it's not the humans that, it's not us that are in his life, although we become tools in the hands of God. It's the power of God to change a life. And so if you're suicidal, and I realize that, that there are some listening right now live, you know, you're listening to the Bible study right now, that's your place. Ask for help. Ask for help. Let us come alongside of you and pray with him. Pray through this time. And maybe you're listening to this, you know, somebody sent you a link, or there's a little video clip of this, or you got a CD and popped it into your CD player. Ask for help. You can contact us here at the church at calvaryaurora.org, or... Uh, you can call the church, um, our church, 303-628-7200, or, I mean, there are churches up and down on every street in your neighborhood. You probably see one driving to the market. Um, certainly they can help. Somebody can help. Ask for help. Suicide is not from the Lord. Ask for help and we'll pray with you. We'll give you Bible scriptures. We'll find some resources to give you. We'll walk walk alongside of you as God repairs your life, as God restores your life, and God reinvigorates your life. What Saul did here was wrong. And what Saul did in asking his armor bearer to do was wrong. It was sinful. It was, and it is, and it forever will be. And your life matters. People love you. Your life touches other lives. And so I wanted to touch on that because that's an important question. And the Bible is a real book. It's living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And the Bible tells us in 1 Peter that we've been given all things pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him. And what that means is that any issue in life, God has spoken on it to bring light in our lives and to give us clarity to take another step and to take another breath, and to give just one more chance to the situation. One more chance, really, for the God of the situation to intervene. And so when you're studying the Bible, it has a lot to say about these things. And I'm encouraged by that, that the Lord would bring about truths to spare lives. Verse 7 now, as Saul and his sons are dead, prophetically fulfilling the, the word of the Lord through Samuel, 
And when the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley and those who were on the other side of the Jordan saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook the cities and fled. And the Philistines came and dwelt in them. So it came to pass the next day when the Philistines came to strip the slain that they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Geboa. And they cut off his head and stripped his, off his armor and sent word throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim it in the temple of their idols and among the people. And then they put his armor in the temple of the Ashtoreth and fashioned his body to the wall of Beth Shan. Now with the victory came the spoils, unfortunately, for the Philistines. They got the cities and the possessions. And the Philistines took great joy in abusing the body of Saul. It's not unlike, as they cut off his head, and it's not unlike what we're seeing with ISIS today. A uh, very good picture of the ancient Amalekites or Philistines. Just vicious cruelty with no regard for human life whatsoever. No regard for the sanctity of women or children or life itself. And so they strip off his armor, cut off his head, and they parade it both from place to place in their land, finally displaying it in their temples, as we'll learn when we study First Chronicles. The armor was put in the temple of their goddess Ashtoreth, and the head was put in the temple of Dagon. And finally, they publicly display the mutilated corpse of Saul and his sons outside the city of Bet Shan, where we will be on one of the stops of our tour to Israel. They take King Saul's body, they fashion it to the wall, they cut his head off, pass it around from city to city. And understand from the concept or the perspective of a, of a Jewish person of the day, to not receive a proper burial was both humiliating and sacrilegious. And for the body to be mutilated like this and then exposed was even more scandalous. And so the Philistines were letting their people know and their idols know that they had won a great victory over their chief enemy, the people of Israel. It really, what they were saying is Dagon triumph, triumphed over Jehovah. That's what they believed. And we'll find that not to be true in later studies. Verse 11. And when the inhabitants of Jabesh and Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and traveled all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Bethshan, and they came to Jabesh and burned them there. Then they took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree at Jabesh, and fasted seven days. Which leads us to another one of those questions that comes up. And I know that the Bible study ending 1 Samuel chapter 31 isn't the most popular of topics. Death, suicide, and now the topic of cremation. But I do want to mention that because, again, that is a common question. In verse 12, it says, All the valiant men arose and traveled all night. They took the body of Saul and the bodies of son, and it says at the end of their sons, and they burned them there, which would be the equivalent of what we would see today as cremation. And so the another common question that comes up, um, that comes up often, is, is cremation a viable option as well as a traditional burial service. You know, you can choose between a traditional burial service at the loss of a loved one, and you can also choose cremation. Is cremation okay for the believer's body? And a lot of times that question is asked in a very genuine, sincere way, because then the question is, what about the resurrection? You know, if you, if you cremate the body, then what will happen in the resurrection? And I think it's a good question to ask. And I, I like what Pastor Chuck has taught us over the years. And I'll quote him here when he said, and I quote, Cremation does in 37 minutes what nature will do in 37 years with the body. And it's just a practical response. It only speeds up the process of natural decomposition. It reduces the body back to dust that it was created from. Remember Genesis chapter 3, verse 19? In sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And personally, I see as a pastor no problem with cremation, both personally as just as a man and also scripturally. You see, the body, even though we place great emphasis on the body today, even as the Bible speaks about how we take great care of our body, the Bible even says this, no one hated their own flesh. 
And, and if you go, well, you know, I don't, I don't really like my flesh all that much. Okay, let's test that. All of you had a great day at work today. Yes, we had a lot of yays. Great, excellent. So tomorrow, let's not spend so much time on your body before you go to work. Just get up and go to work like you went, got up from bed. Don't brush your teeth, don't comb your hair, don't change your clothes, nothing. <laughs> Except for Dan, that doesn't count. I know that's what you do, but I didn't want to talk about that. <laughs> and, and so try that, try that in your life, and with the exception of our brother back there, <laughs> most people don't. Most people don't go to work in their pajamas. Although there was a season here uh, when I was working in the business world that there was a gal that came to work in her pajamas. She worked nights, I guess you give it to her, but she came to work in her pajamas. It was the first I ever saw in my life. Here I said, oh, Colorado, welcome to Colorado, Ed. <laughs> She's a great gal, man. She is such a faithful worker, but coming to work in your pajamas, come on now. Turn over to 1st, 2nd Peter, chapter 1. We love our bodies, but our body is not the real you. And the point I'm trying to make is that we spend so much time on our bodies, we spend so much time trying to reduce the, the aging process and, and to, to cover up blemishes and, and whatever. We comb our hair, we do, we do. We take so much, we place so much emphasis on our bodies that we may forget that the body is only a temporary tent where you and I dwell in for just a little while. It is only the mechanism on earth today that God uses to animate and communicate our personality, our, our soul, and our spirit. Now, that's no reason. Again, it's very similar to the earth that's been created. The earth has been created for us to be good stewards of it, but we also recognize that the earth is going to be destroyed, and a new heavens and a new earth is coming. Just like our bodies are going to be replaced with new bodies. But that doesn't give us permission just to wreck our bodies. It doesn't give us permission just to trash the earth, but rather to take care of it as good stewards as unto the Lord. It's similar on a very practical way. When you, you get a car, you take care of it as much as you can so it'll last as long as it can. Uh, you want to get your money's worth out of the car, and you don't just kind of take, take advantage of it and destroy it because, if, oh, you know, I can always get a new one. They're pretty expensive. And, and who wants another car payment, for goodness sake? I mean, nobody does, really, for that matter. And so you take care of the things that you have because you want them to last. You've made an investment in it. And so the investment that God has made in us is through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. So you want to take care of your bodies, even though, hey, it's not permanent. Our bodies are, not, are in the natural process of decay right now. Our bodies are not getting better and better. They're winding down. And over time, things aren't working the way they're supposed to be working. And things aren't healing as fast as you want them to heal. Why? Because it's appointed once for a man to die. And then the judgment. The reality of sin is that the wages of sin is death. And death, by definition, is the separation of our soul and spirit from our body. And so the body is not the real you, although we spend so much time on it. Notice with Second Peter chapter 1. Uh, would you go there with me to verse 12? As Peter describes death for us, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Therefore, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know them and are established in this present truth. Yes, I think it's right, as long as I'm in this tent. A tent is temporary. You guys go camping, you put the tent up, you take the tent down. A tent is very temporary. It's not like building a house with a strong foundation. This tent is temporary. We're, we're going to leave this tent. As long as I'm in this tent, as long as I'm here, I'm going to stir you up, verse 13, by reminding you, knowing shortly I must put off my tent. Just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. After the soul and spirit depart, the body is no longer you. The real you is beyond your physical into the spiritual. Remember what Jesus said? Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 10, verse 27. He said, whatever I tell you in dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach out on the housetops. And do not fear those that kill the body, 
but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. The destructive power of God. As you survey life, it's unfortunate. I mean, when you think of it, it's unfortunate in some of the ways that some of our loved ones have died in, in fire. And there's car accidents and house or factory fires and so many in the early church were cremated as they were burned at the stake for their faith. And so when a question comes up between burial and cremation, it's just really a personal decision that a family makes. And they make it as unto the Lord. The Bible doesn't forbid cremation. You know, it's interesting how these two things are in the same chapter where the Bible strongly forbids suicide but doesn't forbid cremation. It says in the same chapter, we have a strong word from the Lord on one thing and another thing where he leaves the decision to us personally. But I was thinking about this as we close, you know, as we wind down in the chapter, I was just thinking about this, that I want to be in the generation that doesn't die. Do you? <laughs> I want to be in the generation that doesn't die. The Bible promises, according to 1 Corinthians chapter, well, let's read it together. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, get over there with me, and we'll flip the pages over and move the apps if you have to. 1 Corinthians 15 I want to be in the generation that doesn't die. There's a promised generation that will not die. An exception. Because in chapter 15, in verse 50, it says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit inner corruption. But behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but will be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Paul's talking about the rapture of the church being reunited with the Lord in the air. Glorious, expectant, can happen at any time. Do you want to be in that generation? I hope so. I hope so. Okay, back in 1 Samuel. Look, at, look with me at verse 13. The end of Saul's life and reign. A sad life, not the type. You know, we learn by examples uh, in the scriptures. The Bible says that these things have been written for ad, our admonition on the ends of the age. Like we, the, the, the true stories of the men and women that have gone before us are written so that we can learn from them. And they are examples And there are two types of examples. There are good examples and there are bad examples. And you have to be so careful of bad examples, especially now. Stepping away from the scriptures for a second, because the Bible says that evil company will corrupt good habits. So bad examples now and hanging out with bad examples, they're just going to make you less of a believer. They're going to make you less fervent. You know, you think about the people you're hanging around with right now. Are they taking you closer to the Lord or are they moving you farther away? Well, you know what? We come to church together. Well, that's great. Amen. What do you do when you're not here? Well, you know, I don't think I can really share that from the testimony, Ed. I know because evil company will corrupt good habits. Maybe you're the one that's corrupting other good habits and you need to repent. God is calling you to a higher level of living, not a lower level. He's calling you upward, not downward. He's calling you to be someone who you're not and away from who you were instead of dabbling one foot in the world and maybe, you know, a little toe in the church and then you're living for the things of the world and then coming, you know, being in a church environment so you can look like you're spiritual and you can act like you're spiritual, but what you have the appearance of you have what you look like. You, you look, you have the appearance of godliness, but you deny the power thereof. And Saul is one of those examples that you want to learn from not to copy. I don't want to be like King Saul. And, and you notice in verse 13, it says, then they, then they took their bones and buried them under a tamarisk tree at Jabesh, and then they started fasting seven days. That's just it. That's the end. It's over for Saul. And Saul had such a life to follow. It was so sad. It was hard at times. It was stern. It was a stern warning for me. I I saw so much of when Saul was taking things into his own hands and being fleshly. You know what? The Bible says it's a mirror, and I could see myself at times in Saul. I could see some of the decisions I've made at times. I could see taking things into my own hands and my own life. I could see it. 
That's partly why, you know, I don't want to be like Saul. I don't want to see any of my life in him, but unfortunately, we do if we're honest and open before the Lord. Remember with, with, with Saul, it's not how you start the race that matters, it's how you finish. Because Saul started really well and he finished really bad. You know, I, I see so gloriously the opposite in the life of King Saul, or excuse me, of Saul of Tarsus, who took his, no doubt he was named after King Saul, where he started out so bad, so religious, but so bad, until he was met on the road uh, to Damascus and knocked off his beast and he was born again. Then his life really began. And he started off well and he ended well. His final words to young Timothy before he loses his life, it's, it's the final words that he shares with Timothy that he didn't waver in his life. The final words he shares in his, in his letter to Timothy that his heart was steadfast toward God. He says, well, if you want to look there with me, 2 Timothy chapter 4. I have it in my notes for us to turn there, so let's just see it as we head out. The opposite of King Saul. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. This is what I want to be able to be said at, at my funeral. My memorial service is what I want to be able to set if, if somebody decides to bury me and put a stone there. This is what I want on it. This is what I want to be remembered for. This is what I, my life's goal and where I'm aiming in a practical way where he says in verse 6, I'm already poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure at hand, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have kept the faith. And finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. And even if I'm, even if uh, those, my family members, however it goes down, even if I'm cremated, I just want to be remembered this way. Because my body is, you know, after, I, I just know that after I die, that my ministry here on earth is over. So while I'm alive, I want to give all that I can to the things of God. Because once it's done, it's done. That's it. Once we take our last breath, the only thing that's left is our, well, is our reputation. What what do we leave? What kind of life do we live? Well, I'll tell you what. I have fought a good fight. I finished my race. And I have kept the faith. That's my goal. That's how I'm going to live my life daily. I've kept the faith. And I love this, how Paul, he's ready. He's not, you know, he's not like, like morbid here. It's like, well, you know, he just faces the reality. I'm in jail. I'm probably going to die. And I'm, I'm reassessing my life. And you know what? Man, I'm ready. I'm ready to see the Lord. I'm not only ready to see the Lord just in theory, like, oh, Lord, let me be in that last generation. But Paul's saying, I'm ready because I've lived my life for him. I'm sold out for him. He tells Timothy in chapter 1, he says, For I know in whom I have believed. What a relationship. Changed everything. And then the very next thing. Are you still in 2 Timothy? Stay there. If you're not, get back there. I I turn too, but I, I got one more thing to show you. This is so sad. Because here in 2 Timothy, right, right after he shares the joy of his own life, What does he say? Notice verse 9 of chapter 4. He says, Be diligent to come to me quickly, because Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. What contrast. Paul, I finished my race. I kept the faith. Demas, the world ripped him off. He's turned away. He's loved that he rejected the ministry and went for the things of the world. There's three times we read about Demas. In the scriptures. In Philemon chapter 1, Demas is in, and Luke is called fellow laborers with Paul. So you know he served with them, running the race with them, fighting the good fight together. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, it says, Demas has forsaken me. He's loved this present world and departed. Okay, let me get back. Philemon chapter 1. That's the, so I gave you the bookends. Here's what he said in the middle. Three years later in Colossians. Okay, let's go back. Okay, let's rewind. Let's rewind. All right? It's been a long day. 
In Philemon chapter 1, Demas is known as, along with Luke, as my fellow laborers. Three years later, in the book of Colossians, he's known as just Demas. And then finally, at the end of his life, he's mentioned as Demas, the one that forsook me. Now, if you think that can't happen in your life, listen, it can. You can start from being on fire for the things of God. And before you know it, you'll be separated from the guys you were connected with, just totally sold out for, hanging out with Luke, hanging out with Paul, serving God. And at the end of your life, you sold out and you are now living for the Lord or the world and no longer living for the Lord. He deserted Paul, turned his back upon him. He goes from fellow servant to regular believer to forsaking Paul. And I see so many in the church. I've seen so many over the years that have started out so well. They're serving. They're spiritual. They're strong. Their families are on track. And then after a few months of trials and testings, a few temptations from the world, they're still around, but they're not serving so much. They're not active. Some of them have stepped down from everything, and they're just kind of hanging out. And they're not, they're not really forsaking the Lord, but they're not really pressing in either. And before you know it, I've seen some of them, after a few years of that, they're not around anymore. And some of the chairs that you're sitting in right now were filled with other people that were on fire for the things of God not too many years ago. And so the question for us today and something to think about is, is it going to be David or Saul in your life? Is it going to be Paul or Demas in your life? Choose wisely. Jesus would put it this way, will it be the narrow gate or the wide gate? Because wide gates fill with a lot of people. It's easy to go through the wide gate with the majority. But that narrow gate, it's hard, it's difficult. There's a cost involved. There's a price to pay. But there's a power of God that will enable you and strengthen you to keep your eyes focused on him. Not to fall backwards, but to press in on the things of the Lord. All right, Lord, thank you for finishing the book of 1 Samuel and uh, giving me the strength to do that and giving us the desire to follow through. And we don't want to be King Saul. I don't want to, I could just speak for myself. I don't want to be King Saul. I, I don't want that in my life. I don't want uh, to let circumstances overwhelm me. I don't want, Lord, to think that I have to take care of things my own or any of the other emotions that he felt. And I always remember that tale of three kings where uh, you, the author said there's a little bit of King Saul in all of us. Well, God, crucify that part of King Saul that's in me. Reveal it to me, Lord. Search me and know me and reveal if there's any unclean thing in me that I might walk with endurance and run the race that's set before me. That at the end of my life, whenever it might be, even if it's today, that I have finished my race and I have kept the faith. That I would grow, Lord, from glory to glory and strength to strength. So God, we just ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us I pray for those that have suicidal thoughts that are really battling and wrestling with the circumstances in their lives. Lord, you would deliver them from their mind, that they would learn to take every thought captive under the obedience of Christ against all those things that are exalting itself against the knowledge of God, all these high-minded things, the spiritual warfare, the demonic activity, the fleshly weakness. I pray for them right now. I pray that you would deliver them that you would encourage them, that you would give them a glimpse of hope, that Asa's story would encourage them. I pray for those that are listening in right now that are feeling guilt because of someone close to them committed suicide. They're just overwhelmed with the feeling that they could have done something and they should have done something and why didn't they see it and so many other questions that are just so condemning and so hurtful, and it's making them discouraged and depressed on top of their grief and on top of their sorrow. I just pray for them right now, Lord, that you would deliver them from that condemnation, that you would release them so that they could grieve properly and they could grieve regularly without the added burden of all the feelings that they have right now. And for some, like someone listening right now, it's been over 10 years since it happened, and they still have those feelings. But I pray you just begin to do a healing of their heart a restoration into their lives, that you would bring hope into their hearts, that they would not beat themselves up over the pain that they have felt for so long, Lord. I pray for that precious family in our church. Well, there's a couple families, actually, that I love very much, Lord, that their children, their kids committed suicide. 
And uh, I just pray for them, Lord. What, what can we do but love them and pray for them and encourage them and, and, and remind them, Lord, that, that there was nothing that they could do. And that you would release them, continue to heal them, continue to, to care for them, Lord, continue to, to build them up, continue to strengthen them. I pray for, uh, I, I pray for Rick and his wife, Lord. Um, I think it's Kay Warren, um, who also just a few years ago had a suicide with their son. And such a prominent place of ministry, Lord. Everybody's throwing eye things at them and, and, and all kinds of weird, hurtful spiritual warfare. And I just pray you'd protect them. They're just they're human beings. That there would be a sense of humanity in our society, especially among us as believers. That we'd be compassionate. Uh, Lord, that we would be, Lord, something other than our own critical selves. And I just pray for them, Lord. I, I can't imagine the, the weight and load of things, especially how you use that man in a tremendous way uh, in so many different places. And, um, you know, even if we don't agree with everything, Lord, all the secondary things, what, why do we make that such a big deal? So I just pray for them, Lord, and I can think of many others who've had a suicide in their lives, Lord. And we rejoice with uh, Ace today. Uh, we rejoice at his life. We rejoice how you saved him, how you rescued him in his deepest, darkest pit. We pray that he got whatever he needed at the dealership, that his finances would get in order, that he could be a good steward of everything you've given to him, that he could give and pour into the kingdom, that you would use him in his gifts and talents. You continue to bless him as he have, you have purpose in his life. You have a direction for his life. The thoughts that you think toward him are good, not evil. You have a plan for him. And I pray that he continue to walk in your strength and, and your goodness. And, and Lord, he's a man. He's not a caller on a radio station. He's a human being. Bless him, encourage him, and multiply him, Lord, that hope would go out through the airwaves today, that there would just be a sense of, yes, maybe God can help me, and that you would act on that, and that we would have so many more testimonies of your faithfulness in all sorts of walks of life. In Jesus' name, amen.